of life chapter 11 the lamp you can open it i whisper pushing the envelope across the seat to lizzie no you she says pushing it back you i toss it into her lap and she tosses it right back oh for goodness sakes james says from the front seat i'll open it guiltily i pass the envelope through the partially open window divider i hear a ripping sound which makes me cringe a little and a letter appears a few seconds later this one isn't a yellowed one as the other one i unfold it slowly oswald's paul emporium date august 11 1958 name simon rudolph age 14 today location manhattan item to pawn multicolored glass lamp personal statement of seller i need the money to buy a silver watch all my friends have nice watches but my mother is too busy spending money on herself at beer Goff's and bloomingdale's to buy me anything she has 20 of these lamps she won't notice one missing she does not notice anything i once stood on my head for 20 whole minutes till my face was purple mother went on grabbing gabbing to her friend on the telephone about what to wear to dinner at the club everyone knows the telephone is not supposed to be used for such everyday things dad claims that i need to learn the value of money but i know the value of money someday i am going to be even richer than him and then i won't need to pawn anything i'll have 50 silver watches when i finish reading it lizzie says wow what a spoiled brat i hand her the letter it says here we got twenty dollars for the lamp silver watches must have cost a lot less back then he looks so intense lizzie says staring at the photo clip to the bottom of the letter i wonder what he was thinking at that moment she tilts the paper so i can see it maybe he's thinking about the meaning of life i suggest you think so why not lizzie leans forward and pushes the letter through the half open window to james what do you think james Without taking his eyes off from the road, James holds the letter in front of him and gives it a quick glance. I think he's wondering if he should have eaten the last pickle. Lizzie and I laugh as James tosses the letter back to us and then raises the window divider the rest of the way. Rain begins to plop down on the car. I'm very glad to be right here, in this car, at this moment. Still finding the keys for the box is never far from my mind. Every minute we're doing something else is making me a little antsy. Lizzie turns away from watching the rain slide down the back window and opens a soda. I clear my throat, <clears throat> asking Lizzie serious questions usually doesn't go over well, but I have to try. <clears throat> um, Lizzie? Hmm, she asks, guzzling the soda so fast I'm afraid it's going to come out her nose. She's not allowed soda in her house. Do you ever, I mean, have you ever, I mean, she glances at her watch theoretically. Spit it out, I'm getting old here. Fine. Do you ever think about the meaning of life? Like, do you think you know what it is? She shakes her head. I try not to think about anything too deeply. It hurts my brain. With that, she turns to the window and stares out at the rain again. There is no parking without a special permit on Mr. Rudolph Street, so James has to park in a lot two blocks away. It costs $20 for one hour, he mutters, something about highway robbery in the Better Business Bureau and reluctantly hands the attendant the keys. The guy eyes the car hungrily as we get out. I bet it's not every day he gets to park a limo like this. As we walk toward the street, I whisper to James that he should check the odometer to make sure the guy doesn't take it for a joyride. You've seen too many movies, James says, but he runs back to the car claiming he forgot something. Luckily, the brief storm ends as quickly as it began, so I don't have to be annoyed at myself for being unprepared. I make a mental note to keep an umbrella in my backpack from now on. A slight mist rises off the hot sidewalk as we head down the block. It gives the neighborhood an eerie glow. Lizzie has passed the lamp holding duties to me, and I notice it gets admiring glances from passerbys. It really is a beautiful lamp, and I've never paid any attention to lamps before. Even though the sun isn't out, the lamp appears to be lit from within. If the lamp hadn't been mine, I wouldn't have wanted to pawn it. James reads out the street address. Not only does Mr. Rudolph not have a number on his door, neither do most of his neighbors. We get no answer at the first door we try, the second is opened by a little kid in a soccer uniform who sneers and says, I don't talk to strangers, before slamming the door in our faces. James mutters something about this being the reason he never had children and then pushes the intercom outside the next door. Good morning, a man's voice rings out. How can I help you today? James leans closer to the intercom and says, We are looking for a Mr. Simon Rudolph. Mr. Oswald sent us. Ah, yes, the voice crackles through the metal box. The mysterious Mr. Oswald, who would never reveal the nature of his business with me. No matter. I am always happy to welcome guests to my home. 
A few seconds later, the door buzzes and James pushes it open. Lizzie and I don't move. What's wrong this time? James says. I don't think this is the right guy, I reply. Lizzie nods in agreement, pulling the letter out of her pocket. What makes you say that? James asks. He doesn't sound anything like this letter, Lizzie says. This guy sounds like he's been taking happy pills. Our guy was spoiled and obnoxious. People change, James says with exasperation. That was nearly 50 years ago, for goodness sakes. This is the right guy. He's expecting us. Oh, all right, Lizzie says, pushing her way past him and into the building. But if we get kidnapped into some cult, my father will be very angry with you. We trudge up three flights of stairs until we reach the right door. It's open a crack. James whispers, I'll be standing right out here. Are you sure? I whisper back, glancing nervously at the door. You'll be fine, he insists and move a few feet away. We better be, Lizzie mumbles. Tentatively, I push the door open a few more inches. Mr. Rudolph? A few seconds go by and I don't hear any noise inside. I glance at Lizzie and she looks uneasy too. Then she reaches past me and pushes the door the rest of the way open. We find ourselves staring into a big, nearly empty room with white walls and wood floors. There is no window, one table. There is one window, one table, one small plastic lamp, one hardback wooden chair, one large frame photograph, a sunset over a beach, and one bowl with one piece of fruit, an apple. The smell of flowers hangs in the air, but I don't see any. As we're taking in the strangeness of it, a spiry, weary man walks through an archway at the end of the room. He is deeply tanned, wearing sandals, brown shorts, and a white t-shirt with the cryptic message, the one who dies with the most toys wins. Based on the letter from Mr. Oswald, he must be over 60, but he looks at least 10 years younger. Uh, are you Simon Rudolph? I ask, searching his face in vain for a resemblance to the intense boy in the faded photo. At your service, he replies with a small bow. And you two are? I'm Jeremy Fink, and this is Lizzie Molden. Lizzie gives the man a small nod. Her red hair and freckles are the brightest things in the room, next to the lamp that I'm holding in the sunset picture. I've heard of traveling with a flashlight, Mr. Rudolph says with a grin. But a whole lamp? And such an ornate one, at that. I quickly hold the lamp out to him. This is yours. You pawned it to Ozzy Oswald in 1958. Mr. Rudolph's eyes widen until I'm afraid they'll pop right out of his head. He steps forward and takes the lamp from me, running his hand over the glass. He says over and over, Mother's old lamp! I can't believe it! I simply can't believe it! Finally, he asks, How did you get this? We uh, work sort of for Ozzy's grandson, I explain. He wanted you to have it back. I'm sort of making that up since I really don't know why Mr. Oswald is returning these items, but it sounded good. He places the lamp on the table and turns to us. It is a thing of beauty, is it not? Yes, I say eagerly. I glance at Lizzie, expecting to see her nodding too. Instead, she's looking around and biting her lower lip. I realize she hasn't said a word since we stepped foot inside the apartment. She looks a bit pale too. You okay? I whisper while Mr. Rudolph walks in circles around the lamp, admiring it from every angle. She whispers back. There's nothing here. It's so empty. There's nothing to take. What do you mean there's nothing to take? My hands are itching. That means I'm supposed to take something, but there's nothing to take. I quickly look over to make sure Mr. Rudolph didn't hear that, but he's still entranced by the lamp. We'll talk about this later, I hiss, grabbing the envelope out of her hand. I walk over to Mr. Rudolph and hold it out to him. This is yours, too. It's sort of, um, got opened a little... He takes it from me, shaking his head in amazement. Why didn't Ozzy sell this? I told him it was a genuine Tiffany. He could have made a pretty penny. I don't know, I tell him honestly. He didn't sell any of the things kids brought to his shop. Is that right? He asks, shaking his head again. Good old Ozzy. Suddenly, Lizzie springs to life and blurts out, Where's the watch? Mr. Rudolph looks confused for a minute, and then he smiles. Ah, the silver watch. I haven't thought about that watch in decades. I wore it every day of my working life. All those long years on the stock exchange. Every tick of the watch marked another drop of life force that I'll never get back. I gave it to a homeless man on the street the day I walked out with my first million. A hush falls over the room. Then Lizzie yells, You have a million dollars? And there's only one thing in each room? Mr. Rudolph laughs and says, I don't have a million dollars anymore. I give most of it away. Look. I grew up with money. Then I made more than I knew what to do with. And you know what? I'm much happier this way. 
All of life's problems come from attachment. When you let go of being attached to things or needing things, a sense of peace comes over you like I can't describe. Lizzie looks doubtful. So how do you pay your bills? He laughs again. I didn't just give it all away. Don't you get tired of looking at the same things, she asks. I was wondering, like, the same thing. Like that picture. It's nice and all, but it's, like, the only thing to look at. He shakes his head. I don't get tired of looking at it. When each object is framed in space, when there are big blank areas around it, it changes subtly every day. When you have 20 of something, the individual object can't shine. Plus, I believe that once you find something you love, something that works, oh, I keep looking for more. People always think there is something better around the corner. I decided a long time ago I'd stop wasting my time looking for something better and enjoy what I had. Is that what your shirt means? I ask. It's a joke, right? Or like, sarcasm? He looks down at the words on his shirt and smiles. <laughs> yeah, this is one of my favorite sayings. The sad thing is, I used to believe it was true. But you can't take things when you, with you when you go. So what is the point of accumulating them? I don't expect you children to embrace this way of life at your age. It's something one has to come to on one's own, if the time is right. I am glad he said that, since I don't want to start feeling guilty over all my books or my mutant candy collection or my comics or any of the rest of my stuff. Still, I can sort of understand what he means. You've heard the expression, go with the flow, right? We nod. Well, that's how I've decided to live my life. If you go along with the flow of life without trying to change others or change situations that are beyond you, life is much more peaceful. He suddenly picks up the lamp and hands it to Lizzie. Here, he says. Why don't you take this? Her mouth literally falls open. Me? Why? I already have a lamp. We all turn to look at the small blue plastic lamp on the table. It looks like one of those lamps you could buy at a drugstore for $5. Wouldn't you rather have this one? She asks. It's so much nicer. He shakes his head. Mine is perfectly fine. It sheds light. That's what a lamp is made for. Everything is at its best when it's done exactly what it's created for. A lamp gives light. An apple gives sustenance and refreshment. A chair is perfect in being exactly what it is. A chair. I have no idea what that means, Lizzie says, looking down at the lamp in awe. But thanks for the lamp. Can I ask you something? I blurt out. He nods with a smile. Anything for such special guests. Is that the meaning of life? What you just said? Jeremy! Lizzie exclaims. I knew she'd be shocked that I asked, but I couldn't help it. If we never find those keys, I still want to know what's inside the box. This man clearly knows a lot about life, and no adult has ever said these things of these before. I can't leave until I know more of what he knows. Mr. Rudolph cocks his head and lows, looks at me sideways. Then he laughs and gestures for us to follow him through the archway into the next room. This visit is just full of surprises. I think we'll need to sit down for this. I glance back at the still partially open front door and hope James won't mind waiting a little longer. The room he leads us to is similar to the one we left, only this one is much smaller with big colorful pillows in the middle of a vase with the largest white and purple flower I've ever seen rest in the middle of the circle. I meditate here, he explains, and if I have guests, this is where we visit. Pick a pillow and make yourself comfortable. Lizzie carefully places the lamp behind her and plops down on a red pillow. I choose a yellow one, and Mr. Rudolph takes the white. Look at the flower, he instructs us. What do you see? Uh, a flower, Lizzie says, then quickly adds, a big white and purple one that smells good? He turns to me. Jeremy, what about you? I stare at the flower, inexplicably wondering if it's going to suddenly turn into something else, like a cat or a matchbook. When it doesn't, I say quickly, same as what Lizzie said. Exactly right, he exclaims, surprising me. It is a large, white, and purple, sweet-smelling flower. An orchid, to be precise. Now, wait here. He unfolds his legs and strides out of the room. Lizzie leans forward and whispers, What are we doing? This is the next plan on our list, I explain, hoping she'll understand. We might never open my dad's box. If I can figure out the meaning of life before my birthday, then at least it won't be so awful if I can't open it. She doesn't answer, only nods thoughtfully. Okay, I get it, but what if the guy doesn't know the answer? Then we'll ask everyone we can. At that moment, Mr. Rudolph returns surprisingly. He is carrying the photograph of the sunset under his arm. He leans it up against the wall and sits it back on the pillow. Now, what does this picture mean to you? Lizzie, you first again. Lizzie fills her cheeks with air and slowly lets it out. What does it mean? She repeats. 
I guess it means whoever took it is a good photographer. It's pretty. How about you, Jeremy? I really don't understand art, I admit. It's nice. It brightens up the room. How does it make you feel? Mr. Rudolph prods. Ooh, kind of sad, I guess. Like it's the end of something, but it's kind of relaxing too. Lizzie? Uh, it makes me want to go to the beach. Mr. Rudolph smiles. Okay, great answers. To me, this photograph reminds me to treasure each moment because they are fleeting. A minute later and the sky would be dark. It also reminds me of the day I took the picture and whom I was with. I can carry the beauty of this sunset with me, inside me, so when I do not see much beauty around me, I can use some of what is stored inside. So, we see that already this one photograph of a sunset means different things to all three of us. But, here's my real question. What do you think it means to the flower? At the same time, Lizzie and I ask, Huh? Exactly! Huh? We repeat. Mr. Rudolph reaches out and lifts the flower out of its face. To a flower, this photograph means nothing. So when you ask what is the meaning of life, there can be no answer that will apply to everyone and everything. This is a photograph, or a sunset, to a flower. We all bring our own perceptions, needs, and experiences to everything we do. We will all interpret an event or sunset differently. He pauses and I am trying to keep up with him. Basically, I say slowly, concentrating on my words. What you're saying is that it's all relative. The meaning of the sunset or of life itself is different for everyone. Exactly, he says. Nah, Lizzie exclaims, getting to her feet. I'm not buying it. I think that there has to be some meaning that means the same thing to everyone. Otherwise, nothing makes sense. Mr. Rudolph smiles and stands up. Fortunately, you have a long time to find out. Not as long as you think, Lizzie mutters. As we head slowly into the big room, I turn to him and ask, But even if the sunset has different meanings for everyone, it still has meaning right? That's a tricky question to answer, Mr. Rudolph says, stopping to replace the frame back on the wall. That sunset will still shine just as surely as the color fl that sunset will still shine just as surely just as the color would seem that the sunset itself doesn't have intent. If the sunset doesn't have meaning apart from what we give it, does a rock or a fish or life itself. But just because a park bench, for instance, doesn't have meaning, that doesn't mean it doesn't have worth. I'm starting to get a headache, Lizzie mutters. We have reached the door now, and I'm not sure I'm any closer to understanding what's in the box. My shoulders sag. Maybe this will help clear things up, Mr. Rudolph says. You need to be sure of the question you are asking. Sometimes people think they are looking for the meaning of life, when really they are looking for an understanding of why they are here. What their purpose is, the purpose of life in general, and that's a much easier question to answer than the meaning of life. Lizzie is already halfway out the door. It is? I ask, pulling her back in by her sleeve. I'm not certain, but I think I see the tip of the white flower petal sticking out of her pocket. You are the same as the lamp, the chair, the flowers, Mr. Rudolph explains. All you have to do is be the most authentic you that you can be. Find out who you really are and find out why you are here, and you will find your purpose, and with it, the meaning of life. Why I am here? I have no idea why I'm here. Am I supposed to know that? Does everybody know that but me? What's wrong with me? I always knew something was wrong with me. Shh! Lizzie whispers. You're sounding crazy. Had I said that out loud? You shouldn't leave empty-handed, Jeremy, Mr. Rudolph says, kindly ignoring my ramblings. That wouldn't be fair. He walks over to the bowl and swoops up the apple. He tosses it to me as I reach up in time just to grab it. To some people for whom such things matter, they might be jealous that their friend got a stained-glass Tiffany lamp while he only got an apple. Luckily for me, I am not one of them. Now, if Lizzie had been given a chocolate bar and all I got was an apple, then there'd be a problem. Lizzie slips through the door and takes off down the hall. I know I need to thank Mr. Rudolph for trying to help us, but my brain can't get past the idea that I don't know why I'm here on this planet. Why do I exist? Um, thank you for everything, your time and all, but I'm still a little confused, I guess. He smiles and pats me on the shoulder. He points to the apple in my hand and says, a wise man once remarked that we can count how many seeds are in the apple, but not how many apples are in the seed. Do you know what he meant by that? I shake my head. Before an apple seed is planted, no one will know how many apples will one day sprout from it. It's all about potential, and potential is hidden from all of us until we embrace it. Find our purpose. Plan ourselves so we can grow. I am certain you will find what you are looking for, Jeremy. Many blessings upon your head. With that, he closes the door, leaving me clutching my apple so tightly that my fingernails have punctured the skin.